Good morning. My name is Clay. I'm one of the pastors along with Mark. And if you don't know me, now you do. And we lead this church together along with Jared, who did the announcements. And Jared is currently an elder or pastoral apprentice, which means he is being trained up. And we are expecting you guys as the church to affirm his pastoral calling. And whether Mark and I are off our rocker to say that he should be one of the pastors along with us. And so we're just excited to have three of us lead you guys in worship to Jesus week in and week out where we get to be part of this amazing church, where together we serve this amazing God. And one of the things we love to do as we gather as the church is to preach and teach through books of the Bible. We love learning from the scriptures because, as as we say often, we believe the Bible is truly as God's word given to us. It's not just a book of rules that's given to us to tell us what to do and to live right, but it's a story of God reminding us of what God has done for us in sending his only son to live the life we could have lived, couldn't live, die the death we should have died, and rise from that death to defeat our enemies of Satan, sin, death, and hell. So we're going to continue on in our series in Colossians, Paul's letter to this church in Colossae, and we're going to be continuing in chapter 3 today. Chapter chapter 3 is pretty long, so we're going to be going only in verses 12 to 17 today. And if you want to bring out your Bible, that'd be great, whether that is in book or app form, either is entirely okay. If you don't have a Bible, you didn't bring one with you, we have a few at the back by the giving box you can take. And if you don't own it, if you don't own a Bible at all, you can just take that home as our gift to you. We want you to be, we want you to be able to read God's word and trust that he is at work through his scriptures that he's given us. So I'm having a hard time speaking, so I'm going to ask Jesus to work through me. And I'm just going to, like we always do, let's pray before we read God's word, though. Father, thank you so much that you are good. We can trust you. We can trust your word. We thank you that you have spoken to us through your word. Pray this morning that you would open our eyes and ears for what you have for us this morning. Give us a knowledge that we couldn't have without you. And I pray that you would work through each and every one of us this morning to not only receive these words, but then to also live them out. Thank you for loving us, for your grace, your mercy. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's listen as the scriptures right on the screen behind me. Reading from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So verse 12 starts out with the phrase, put on then. And the then is actually implying a therefore, or in light of what we have just heard. So he's bringing us back to the previous section, and it really all goes back to, not too similarly to how last week's passage started out, which said, put to death, therefore which means we need to go back up one more level to our identity in Jesus that Paul was reminding us at the beginning of chapter 3. See, if we have this new identity in Jesus, as we're reminded in verse 1 of chapter 3, then there's going to be things that we need to be putting off or putting to death, as Mark brought it last week. And then there's things that we're going to need to put on. Now, I heard Sam Whitehawk, he's the pastor of Grace Evergreen, uh, remind his church that we, we want to think about it this way. If you got yourself really dirty, maybe you've been working hard out in the garden, you're sweating like crazy, it feels pretty good to be clean. It's nice to take a shower, but then after, it would be pretty silly to put those same dirty clothes on. You'd want to put clean clothes on afterwards, right? So in the same way, we we want to actually not just put off the old clothes and making ourselves clean, we now want to put on new clothes. So we don't just put to death the sins that we have, but We need to remember, if Jesus has rescued us from sin, if he's died in our place and he's given us new life, 
if he has actually changed our hearts and our minds, then that means we should be thinking differently and acting differently. How we now respond to this needs to change. So, as the first few verses of chapter 3 remind us, part of that's going to include seeking the things that are above. It's looking at Jesus and his perfect kingdom and then seeking to follow him and his ways. This is going to be part of putting on what he wants us to. Now, again, last week Mark did a great job of helping us to see all, many of the particularities of the kinds of things that we're to put off and put to death. And it started with this selfish or earthly mindset. And, and these things often result in opposing and distorting God's good gifts. And like with anything we distort, by thinking our ways are better than God's, we, we end up turning these things into idols, and our selfishness turns into idolatry. And then we saw we're also to put off a bunch of other things that just don't line up with God's character. So then as we look at verse 12, after Paul once again has just finished reminding us that we're not to be bound to our old identities anymore, we're not defined solely based on what our family, what our country, or the status that we've been born into, he tells us in light of all that, put on them. But then before he even tells us what to put on, he, he again, he, he wants us to remind, he wants to remind us of something. He wants to remind us that being a Christian is not just about stopping certain sins. It's not just about cleaning yourself up, as if you could actually do that anyway by yourself. Because that's a re religious mindset that so many people seem to think that's what it means to be a Christian. It's like they think, oh, well, if you're, if you're a Christian, then you have this big, long list of rules that you need to follow. You can't do this. You can't do that. It's all these don'ts and all these can'ts. But if you look at verse 12, do you actually see where, where Paul takes us? He says this, put on then as, God chosen, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. So let's stop there for a second. Because before anything he wants to remind this church, as, as well as every church who would ever read this letter, that if we are hidden in Christ, if we're saved by Jesus, then we are God's chosen holy people, and we are beloved. Now that phrase, chosen ones, it can be misinterpreted by a lot of people and misunderstood. And, and sometimes there's even those who get freaked out about this kind of thing. And, and funnily enough, it's not brand new believers who get messed up about this, but it's, it's those who grew up in religious Christian circles. And so it's often those that look at God like he's some kind of transactional being. You know, I do a certain amount of good works and then God's going to pay me back for my good deeds. It's transactional. And if I do bad deeds, then I, I suppose since God isn't evil, he'll have to punish these people in some way. So then they come up, I guess that means... I guess I concede that there must be some kind of hell, even though I don't want to, but it's for the really bad people out there. It's, it's a transaction-based system. And so even when they hear the gospel, they think, well, that becomes a transactional event as well, where all you have to do is accept Jesus into your heart, and he gives you a get-out-of-hell-free get card. And so it's more about choosing Jesus among the plethora of other religions out there than it is about anything else. But when you look at the scriptures, it actually tells a way better story. Because God's not just a transactional being. He's a relational being who loves. And not because of some external force, but because God is love himself. And out of this love, he actually created us in his image to show what his character of love is like. And, but when we look at the world around us, we know something's messed up. It's not the way it's supposed to be. But the scriptures tell us that the reason it's messed up is because of sin and rebellion. Our decision to choose self over God, that's what's caused all the chaos, the corruption, and the devastation that we see amongst us. But the beauty is that even though we're sinful, even though we can all attest to not consistently showing the, the rest of the world God's perfect character, God still chooses to love us. Like, that's crazy. God chose to save for himself a people. 
See, if you read the story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you see there's this common thread where there are these broken, sinful people who continue to rebel against God. And then the redeeming and rescuing God of love chooses to pluck out some of these rebels and he shows them love and mercy and undeserved grace by which they end up being transformed and redeemed through their relationship with him. And it's not because they're particularly good, but it's entirely because God is good. And for those who are chosen by God, we see that he makes them holy. In other words, he sets them apart. They become different, which means if you're a Christian, God has chosen you. He's chosen you to claim you as his own beloved. You are set apart, holy, as his redeemed child. And he's done that to allow you to now grow and change in ways that you couldn't and wouldn't on your own. So it's not that God chose us because he was so pleased with our good works. He wasn't pleased with our good deeds and good attitudes. That's not why he chose us. And it wasn't even that he saw potential in us or because he knew that we would choose him. God chose us to show his glory, to show his character. See, sometimes we just need to be reminded that it's not about us. Hopefully we'll see that that's a good thing, but the truth is that God loves us. Just let that sink in for a second, that God loves you. And it's not because of what you do. See, if you call yourself a Christian, the only reason you call yourself a Christian is because God loves you. Doesn't mean you didn't choose God. We, those of us who are Christians, we did. But it all comes because God loves us. He loves us not for what we've done, not because of a decision we've made, and not because of what we will one day become, but just because he loves us. This also means God doesn't just tolerate you. He doesn't just put up with you, but, but God actually chooses to love and enjoy you. It's a big deal to him. And this is good news because this means that when we mess up, and we will, we do constantly, when we go back and we find ourselves giving into all the very things that Mark just reminded us of last week, you know, lust, anger, obscene talk, things we do with our actions, our hands, our mouths, and our minds. When we realize, or on the other end of the spectrum, that we're just trying to do good stuff in order for God to love us, we treat God transactionally, and then we expect him to give us better things than the next person because we think we're so much better than them. In those moments, when, when we actually realize that's what we've been doing, we don't need to wallow in self-pity that all is now lost. We don't need to just now rededicate our lives to try better, to do, do the things that we're supposed to do in hopes that this time it'll be enough. God will finally accept me, finally love me. We're told to, to put off the old self, whether that's the sin of rebellion or the old, the old self of religion. And we're to remind ourselves of, of the truth that we are chosen by God, holy and beloved. So then with our identity in Jesus firmly in place, only then do we now put on what, if you read through this, you'll see this is clearly the character of Jesus. And so when Paul says to now put this on, put on the character of Christ, this is actually an action that we must take. We, we have to choose to do this. It's not going to just happen automatic, automatically. And so we don't just sit there and wait, expecting God to dress us. And so this is a message that Paul gives by the power of the Holy Spirit to those of us who have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And he says, we're to put on these things. But if you remember back to the first chapter of Colossians, Paul also mentioned that everything he does, he does with the energy and the strength that God gives him. So even though we do this, it's because we have the Spirit of God working inside us. 
And he's going to give us the strength and ability to do these things. So we put on these things. And when we look at the context here, I want you to notice that we see that when he's, tooking, when he's talking about putting these things on, they're all ways of relating to one another, primarily in the context of the local church. So again, this, this flows out of a God who's a relational God. So this, this isn't just a, thing, a, a list of things to do to check off a box so that God will love us. It's not so that God will just be pleased with us, but it's actually a way for us to show the rest of the world who God is and what he's like by how we relate to one another, how the church interacts. So first, he starts out with compassionate hearts, kindness. Now, the phrase compassionate hearts, it's really funny because that that can be translated as bowels of mercy. I think the King James actually uses that phrase. You could also translate it as bowels of sharing in suffering. Now, anyone who's ever had some kind of bowel issue before, you know that your your entire body feels it. Like when your bowels act up, your mind, your emotions, your actions and abilities, they're all affected by what's going on down there. In a sense, you, you, you just feel like you can't do anything until that one thing is taken care of until there's some kind of relief. And in the same way, this is what compassion is supposed to be like. When we have compassion for someone, it should affect everything. Your mind, your emotions, your actions should all be moving towards mercy and seeking relief for that person. And the beauty is that Jesus, he's often described as having compassion when he saw people. He cared for people. He felt for people. His life was one identified with compassion, bowels of mercy. And then we're told to also put on kindness, or you could also say goodness. And and there's uh, there's an element of gentleness in that word as well. Now, when it says kindness, let's not associate it with Canadian niceness, you know, where we just set aside the truth in order to get along with people to live by that unwritten Canadian rule of live and let live. That's not, that's not what he's talking about with kindness, but kindness actually goes one step further. And kindness wants the best for others. You don't just want to appear like you want the best for others, like Canadian niceness, but that we actually want the best for others. And that's even when, or maybe especially when, it's undeserved. They don't deserve it. Because when we look at the way that God has shown kindness to us, all I can say is, I look at that and I go, that is completely undeserved for me. Scripture tells us that God's kindness is shown as mercy and grace. So that means for us to show kindness, we need to actually go out of our way to serve others rather than always just looking to be served. It means telling someone the truth, but doing so in a way that lets them know we actually care about them. Now, many of us who have a passion for truth, there's going to be times when we forget about being kind because we can get so single-mindedly focused on winning an argument or proclaiming the truth or fighting for truth that our focus just becomes about winning. It becomes about being right. And then we forget the actual goal of proclaiming the truth is for others to grow closer to Jesus, right? Right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If Jesus is the truth, then that means the truth should point to him. It's not about us winning. And so we should probably ask ourselves the question, if my goal is someone coming to see and savor Jesus, is my insistence that I seem to have over and over again in proving myself right all the time, is that going to lead to repentance? The goal should be that truth leads to repentance, right? But we also need to remember that Paul's letter to the Roman church said that it's actually God's kindness that leads to repentance. It's not kindness against truth, but kindness works with the truth. And when you think about kindness, it really does flow out of compassion, doesn't it? And so it's going to mean we have a heart that looks at someone as a person, made in the image of God, not just an adversary and and not even just a project, 
that they're a person. And so next, we're also told that we're to put on humility and meekness. Now, in our culture, in in many places, humility and, and meekness, those are things seen as virtues. But to the early Greek culture, in in the time that this was written, nobody wanted to be seen as humble or meek. They were not on any list of virtues. You were to show yourself as powerful, strong, confident, and competent. There was no place for humility. But but I mean, even when you think about in, in that perspective, we probably still feel the same way too, though, today, don't we? We'd rather be seen as confident, power, powerful, and strong than humble in most circumstances, don't we? But, now, but when we talk about humility, we also need to remember that humility is, is not just low self-esteem or, or thinking you're, you're so lowly or that you're no good, because that's actually pride disguised as humility. The focus is still on you and what you haven't lived up to. You're still focused on your own expectations of your image and how you look to others around you. So that's not humility either. And so to think about what C.S. Lewis said, he he said humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And so if you do think of yourself at all, you, you actually see yourself not through the lens of others or even through the lens of your own eyes, but humility sees yourself the way that God sees you. And so this also means that a humble person who is good at something doesn't need to downplay their gifts or their talents. If God gave you those gifts, it's because he wants it to glorify him. So if someone tells you that they appreciated something you did or notices something that you're good at, it's actually false humility to say, oh, it's not that big a deal, or I'm not really that good at it, or so-and-so is so much better than me. See, in humility, you don't have to deflect, you don't have to feel awkward about it. You can just simply say thank you. And then you thank Jesus for the gift that he gave you to share with others. And and then meekness, that literally means strength under control. It means one who goes out of their way to restrain their power in order to make room for others. So to put on humility and meekness, it, it doesn't mean you're a doormat, but it does mean you display a willingness to know when to stand down, when to step aside. And so it shows a submissiveness, even when you know you have the strength to do otherwise. And next we're told to put on patience. Now, this is going to be a hard one for most of us, isn't it? Especially in the culture that we live in where we, we want to make sure everything happens instantly. So we just don't have time for patience, do we? But what do you think it looks like for you to have patience not just in general, but specifically with those around you. How do you have patience with people? Probably means slowing down a bit and trying to see something from someone else's perspective, doesn't it? Or maybe it means giving others time to grow, not expecting change to be instant and super obvious right away. I mean, if we're parents, which many of us are, and we tell our kids to do something right away, it's not that often that they just... It clicks and they get it and they forever obey us and we only ever have to tell them once. That doesn't usually happen. So it takes some patience to remember that God is at work. His spirit loves our kids more than we do. The other people that we love and interact with, that we might have given some great wisdom to, we're going to need some patience to allow God to work through them. And I think patience... It actually helps a lot with the next one, verse 13. It says, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Now, this is where we see that being part of the church isn't easy, is it? If we're to actually live out the one another's of being the church together, there's going to be times when people grade on us. I mean, if everything about being the church was easy all the time, if there was never any conflicts, nobody ever sinned against anybody, if there was never anything difficult about someone that made it so you actually had to bear with them, and this is all still happening before Jesus has come back, then I think you just have a shallow representation of the church where people aren't actually getting to know each other. 
People aren't on the front lines of mission inviting others into discipleship and being discipled themselves. Because the truth is that we're all a mess. Some of us might be more messy than others, but we're still all a mess. None of us are perfect. But if we carry on pretending like everything is great all the time, everyone has it all together, then we just misrepresent ourselves and we misrepresent the gospel. Because the gospel is good news for sinners who need a savior. And we don't become perfect just because we've been saved. Now, one day we will be perfect, but that day is not yet today. And so the truth is the community, if you're bearing with one another, if you're being with one another, it's going to create conflict. We don't want it to, but it, it just does. Whether we want it to happen or not, if we live in close proximity to other sinners, even if they're saved by Jesus, they're just, there's a, eventually going to be conflict. But we need to ask ourselves, what am I going to do in that conflict? Am I just going to give up? Maybe it depends on how big the conflict. Am I just going to, I just can't deal with that. We're just going to go to a different church. It's too awkward. Or maybe if you don't feel like switching churches, maybe I'll, I'll move to a different community group. Be part of a different gospel community. Is that what you do? Or do you bear with them? Now, there's going to be times when bearing with someone just means you need to show continued patience, humility, and compassion. All those other things we put on are going to help us in bearing with one another, aren't they? Now, sometimes there's not even necessarily a sin issue. Maybe, maybe it's just a personality you don't really care for. Maybe you find yourself disagreeing with someone's preferences. Or maybe, maybe there's just someone who cheers for the wrong sports team. And in those instances, are you willing to bear with them for the sake of Jesus? Can you put up with that person you think is a little annoying? But, may, but maybe it's not just that. Maybe there's actual sin at stake. Maybe you've been wronged. Maybe you've been hurt. So the question remains, are you willing to bear with them still? And are you willing to go the extra step and forgive them? Are you willing to absorb the pain and the hurt and not make them pay for it? See, forgiveness, it, it doesn't guarantee immediate and full restoration to the relationship. And it doesn't mean that you tell them it's okay, it wasn't that big of a deal. You can name the sin, you can call them out in it, you can tell them how it hurt you. But at the end of the day, forgiveness isn't optional for the Christian. I mean, just look at what Paul says. He says, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. That's not a suggestion, is it? He says we must forgive. And he bases it, he bases it on the fact that we've been forgiven by Jesus. See, if that's true, if, if Jesus has forgiven us of our sin, to withhold forgiveness from a brother or a sister in Christ, it actually denies the truth of the gospel. Because when we do that, we say to Jesus that his death on the cross was not enough to pay for that sin. What that person did to me was way worse than anything I've ever done to Jesus. That's what we're saying when we don't forgive. So we need to remind ourselves of what we've actually been forgiven for. We've sinned against a holy and righteous and perfect God. He should be able to tell us to do whatever he wants because he is perfect. He knows what's best and he's good. And yet we've chosen to go our own way, to decide what's right in our own eyes. And even though we've rebelled, even though we've sinned against him, what we actually see in this amazing God is that he's forgiven us. He took the pain that we deserved. He took the punishment that we deserved when Jesus went to the cross. But we can't do any of this without love, which is why Paul continues in verse 14 and 15 to say, And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. 
And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. So he says that as we do all these things, as we put on all these other attributes, we do so with love as the binding agent. See, love is the glue that holds all these things together. And the truth is that love is the glue that holds us, the church, together. That piece that he talks about in verse 15, that's a, a unifying piece. It's the language that, that they use for peace between nations. So as we put on these things, as we seek to do so in love, then we should actually be able to do so in a way that shows the unity that Jesus wants from his church. It doesn't mean we'll all look the same. It doesn't mean we all act the same. But it means that when we gather, we're, we're dealing with these relationships. And we're loving the people that God has put in front of us. And that this love, it, it comes from God and it works through us to sing an amazingly beautiful song to the world around us so that they can see who God is and what he's like. And so you see, Paul's reminding us once again that, that being a Christian is not just about checking the boxes and doing the right things, is it? It's not about following lists of rules or a bunch of do's and don'ts. It really is about reflecting the character of God. And you can't reflect the character of God unless you love one another because God is love. So our goal isn't just to do the right things, but our goal is to be connected to God. And then to be so hidden in Christ that he shines through us. And in that, he says to be thankful. How often do you, do you stop to just be thankful? Have a thankful heart. I think a thankful heart changes things, doesn't it? Just stop and think about being thankful for a second. Even, even if you think about some of the things that we were told to put off, it's pretty hard to be thankful and angry at the same time, isn't it? And you're probably less likely to covet if you're in the middle of thanking Jesus for all that he's given you. Or maybe if we think about the sexual sin that Paul talked about to put off. Husbands, it's going to be really hard for you to continue down the path of lust if you're cons consistently thanking God for your wife. So are you doing that? If you're battling lust, are you thanking God for your wife? Is that a regular pattern? And wives, if you're battling discontentment, do you thank Jesus for the husband that you have? And even more to the point of what Paul is actually trying to get at, though, are we thanking Jesus for the church that we get to be a part of? Do you thank Jesus for your gospel community? Do you even thank Jesus for that person you have a hard time getting along with? You see, a thankful heart is a heart that's full of the truth and the beauty of the gospel. Because we realize that everything that we have is a gift from God. Everything good that we've received is from him. And even the difficulties that we have were given to us to learn more about God and to be transformed in the person that God wants us to be. And he's made us to be by his grace. So then with that thankfulness, when the church gathers, this is what we get to see in verse 16. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, again, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So if we want to remain thankful, if we want to be able to reflect God to the world, then we're going to see the importance of a few things that Paul brings out here. So first is the focus on the word of Christ dwelling in us richly. Now, this is why such a large portion of what we do here on Sunday mornings as we gather as the church, is we focus on the scriptures. We want you to get to know Jesus through his word. But it's not enough for you to just hear a 40-minute sermon once a week, is it? With all the competing messages you're getting every day, from social media to the shows we watch to the conversations we participate in in our jobs, we're getting words and stories and ideas fed to us constantly. But it says here we're called to have the word of Christ 
dwell in us richly. So if the word is to dwell in us, to take root, to fill us up, that means we're going to actually have to spend some time digging into that word ourselves, aren't we? And then in addition, when our gospel communities gather, we're to be teaching and admonishing one another. See, it's not just about coming and listening on a Sunday, hearing a sermon, which is good and it's helpful. It's why we do it. I can teach and I can admonish you. Mark can teach you and admonish you. Jared can teach you and admonish you. But we are called here to teach and admonish one another. Again, this is one of the reasons why being a part of a gospel community is so important. And admonishing, that word actually means to warn or correct. And so when we do that, we we need to do that with God's word too, which is why, again, we need the word of Christ dwelling in us richly. So that means we're going to need to know our Bible. And if we're in community and we want to be able to teach and admonish one another, we're going to need to know each other. So you need to know your Bible and you need to know people. We need to be close enough in community that we can see each other's struggles, see each other's sins. And then we need to be open and honest with others so that we can actually receive teaching and correction. And so then, in addition, when we gather on Sundays, this is one of the reasons we sing. Not just because it's commanded, but because we have thankfulness in our hearts. That God has created human beings with a desire to sing when they're thankful about something. And when it says songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, he's letting us know that there's, there's so many ways to sing. We don't all need to sing one style or one type of music. Different cultures, different churches. We're going to sing different songs, and that's okay. But we need to see that even in our songs, part of that still needs to line up with the teaching and admonition, doesn't it? It's not a separate thing. So that means that our teaching shouldn't be void of thankfulness and our songs shouldn't be void of the word of Christ. And so this is even why we choose the songs that we choose to sing on Sundays. We want music that's in line with God's word. Songs that teach, even songs that admonish. Like I love how when we were singing Joy to Be today, there's parts of that where it's, it's really admonishing one another, isn't it? It's admitting our sin, admitting our need for a savior. So this is why we sing songs that help us to truly embrace the truth and the beauty of the gospel, that we have that Savior. And we do all this, again, as it says, with thankfulness. And so then this is what Paul finally says in verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So in whatever you do, whether you're gathering with the church or with your gospel community, whether you're making supper at home, whether you're trying not to fall asleep in class, or whether you're grinding it out at work, in word, in deed, in your thoughts, your actions, and your words, Paul says to do everything in the name of Jesus. And when he says the name, the name is more than just what we call Jesus, but it's actually speaking of his person and his character which is what we're supposed to put on, right? So he's reminding us that, once again, if we are in Christ, if we belong to him, if we're chosen by him, then we can be clothed in his character. So then with our words and our actions, because we've been loved, because we've been set apart and made holy, because we've been chosen to be God's messengers and ambassadors, let's put on Christ. Let's live as though we're saved. Let's bear with one another, forgive one another, love one another, and even enjoying one another. And let's do so with thankful hearts because God is gracious. And I just love that we get to be part of a church that, like, honestly, you guys make it easy. And I, here's a crazy thought. I hope that he makes it less easy because I hope that we continue to reach out and bring people into the fold who need to learn and grow Because I don't just want to stay a church that is nice and easy. I want us to be a church that loves when it's hard, that loves those who may not be as lovable. And so let's invite those people in. Tell them they can be part of the family. They can be part of God's kingdom. 
doesn't matter how much someone has sinned, God can forgive them and we can forgive them too because of his spirit's work in us. So let's just pray. Father, I thank you that you love us. We thank you that we are chosen by you. Thank you that we are holy and set apart because of the work that you've done on the cross for us, Jesus. I pray that we would be a church that goes out and shines forth the amazing light that comes with your character and who you are, Jesus. I pray that we'd be transformed into your likeness by the work of your spirit and that as we put off the old deeds of the flesh, we would put on Jesus and that we would be able to love each other more and then help others to love you more as well. I'm so thankful that we get to call on your name. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.